the field of educational computing for the past 27 years, trying to help teachers make sense of the wonderful opportunities that are available to kids and provided by digital computation and communications technology. I've been teaching online for more than 15 years, and 19 years ago I had the great good fortune of leading professional development at the first schools in the world where every kid had a laptop. So let me say that again. I've been working in schools where every kid has a computer since 1990. Um, so I have a, a, a large breadth and depth of experience and information that I'd like to be able to share with you today and talk about the issues of where are we, where might we go, and which ideas should, should sustain us as we try to create opportunities for kids that wouldn't have existed otherwise. The thing that excites me most about computing is not that it allows us to learn the things that teachers have always wanted us to know, maybe with greater efficiency or efficacy or comprehension or stickiness, but that it creates genuine opportunities for kids to learn and do things that would have been completely impossible just a couple of years ago. And yesterday I showed a number of these examples in a robotics context. I'll share a couple more of them with you today in the time that we have together whether it's robotics or game design or, or software invention or simulation building or music composition, the computer is at best an intellectual laboratory and vehicle for self-expression. Um, it allows us to do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So, there are, there are a number of resources that might be useful to you. I'm the executive director of something called the Constructivist Consortium. And if you go to constructivistconsortium.org slash books, there's a large collection of resources that you might want to read and explore. There's a handout that contains lists, links to a lot of articles that I've written as well as, as well as materials you might want to use in your own teaching or in your teaching of teachers. And that's at stager.org slash cutter. And there's information up front and in the lobby, the entranceway, about an event that I'm running this July in the United States, if any of you can come. Um, it's a four-day immersive minds-on institute where you can learn and collaborate and mess about with technology and use it in creative ways and also interact with some of the great minds, some of the great thinkers and educational leaders of the last half century like Herbert Cole and Deborah Meyer. Okay, now there's a quote here on the screen that I think is really provocative. And it says, the phrase technology and education usually means inventing new gadgets to teach the same old stuff in a thinly disguised version of the same old way. Moreover, if the gadgets are computers, the same old teaching becomes incredibly more expensive and biased towards its dumbest parts, namely the kind of rote learning in which measurable results can be obtained by treating the children like pigeons in a Skinner box. That's from an article called Teaching Children Thinking that my colleague and friend Seymour Papert wrote in 1971. I don't think there's a more, there's a better piece of, of thinking about computers and education that's been written in the last 10 years as this document from 1971. And one of the big ideas of this presentation is that in order for us to innovate in education, we need to have an understanding about the attempts at innovation in the past the current attempts, and we need to learn lessons of history. We need to stand on the shoulders of giants. We need not be hostile to theory as some sort of esoterica that's, that's abstractly removed from the classroom, but rather it gives us a language for talking about what we want to do and we want, what we want as a result children to learn. So I'm going to be in this presentation talking about some of what I think are the greatest educational ideas in the world. This list is incomplete. It's entirely arbitrary, but the big idea here is that there are big ideas that we can build our future educational environments on. In fact, that future could begin tomorrow. That's all another way of saying that every problem has been solved somewhere. There isn't a single educational issue confronting Qatar or the United States or anywhere in between that hasn't been addressed and satisfactorily solved somewhere else. We, for some reason, we keep reinventing the same mistakes over and over again in education. Um, it's as if bad ideas are timeless, and it's the good ones, the good ideas, that are incredibly fragile. Those little pockets of innovation that the system tends to crush very quickly, we need to understand that so that we can 
use technology in the ways that maximize our investment, to create the greatest potential for students, and allows for the greatest achievement that we would imagine. You know. Now, having said all of that, it's worth thinking about the technology it, as driving what happens in classrooms. It has always been the case that what you did in a classroom was based on the dominant accessible technology of that day. Whether it was a blackboard or handheld slates or pencil and paper, the curriculum reflects that dominant technology. So it should come as no surprise that if kids have computers in their shoes and servers in their bedroom and handheld devices and expectations about the world in which they live that don't match up with school, that school ought to reflect some of that technology. What concerns me, there's been a lot of discussions about what's going on in the UK in which every classroom got this interactive whiteboard and I put interactive in inverted commas because it's not quite clear to me what's the interactive part other than sort of smacking it or pointing to it. You know, I think mo the best interactivity happens between your ears. But the policy was we're going to buy one of these things for every classroom in the country because they're big and they look like the future and politicians can get their photographs taken in front of them. And then we will invent a methodology for using them. We'll invent some reason to have them. Now, I'm not saying that there is no practical, constructive use of an interactive whiteboard. Some teachers might use it in a terrific fashion. They should have them. But the notion that everyone should get the thing because some bureaucrat thought so or because some salesman made a good pitch, I think is a really bad idea. And it's a bad idea for the following reason. It's a pre-Gutenberg technology that turns a teacher into sort of a priest who's chanting to the, to the monks who are taking dictation. And my concern is that a lot of these classroom technologies wrongly reinforce the dominance in the front of the room, and as a result, are creating a greater gulf between the teacher and the child, the teacher and the learner, not just physically, but intellectually and emotionally as well. And what I'm finding in my work in schools all over the world is an increasing number of teachers who haven't even had it occur to them that they could sit next to a child and work on something that was mutually interesting and beneficial. That if the technology could do anything, it should break down these, these power structures of I'm on the stage, you're on the floor, you should listen to what I have to say, and create opportunities where we can work and learn together. So, I'm going to share with you a number of what I consider some of the best ideas in the world. As I said a moment ago, this list is entirely arbitrary. Some of these ideas don't use computers at all, but I'm going to then share with you ways in which the computers can be used to, to model those approaches, to an, augment, to enhance those approaches. And in some cases, the technology use is the powerful idea in and of itself. So, that, some of these include personal fabrication, the Reggio Emilia approach from Italy, student robotics, kids being engaged in video design and computer science, the learning theory of Papert's constructionism, Generation Yes, One Laptop Per Child, the Venezuelan Youth Orchestra, and these are all ways in which computers could be used as intellectual laboratories and vehicles for self-expression. Now, in order to decide how we're going to transform schools or how we're going to even operate schools, and how we're going to use technology in them, it's increasingly important that we decide what it is we believe as educators. What is our stance? What is our view on teaching and learning? What's our view on the role of computers? And I find that this sort of breaks down into three thinkers. And the first one is Alfred Bork. And Alfred Bork was a computer science and physics professor in the United States who passed away a couple of years ago. And since the 60s, he was speaking at conferences and presenting papers in which his central thesis was teachers are stupid, they have the lowest test scores of any professional group, and we have a shortage of them. So his solution was we could design teaching machines that would replace the teachers, that the, solu the solution to the problem would be to put computers in charge of delivering the curriculum. Then you had my friend Tom Snyder, who was a software developer. He was an incredibly creative teacher who became a software developer. In the mid-1980s, he was trying to figure out a way to keep his business afloat. He looked around at the landscape like any good entrepreneur would do, and he realized that every classroom, particularly in Western countries, had a computer in it. So his company designed software for the one computer classroom. And the computer was a prop, the teacher was an actor, the classroom was a stage, and the computer was used to simulate 
role-playing activities and such and keep the teacher at the center of all activity and have the kids just sort of buzz around and orbit the teacher. And then there's Seymour Papert, who beginning in the mid-1960s started talking about every kid having a computer and a computer being this space where you can mess about with powerful ideas and where you could learn mathematics in a natural way as if you would learn French by living in France as opposed to sitting in a classroom and being taught French. This is all a way of saying you need to decide who has agency in your classroom. Who has the power? Is the responsibility for learning on the learner? Is it a result of being taught? Or is it because some bureaucrat in the ministry somewhere has decided what you need to know on, on a particular day and time? And, the, and there are products being sold primarily for those bottom two at any educational technology conference you go to in the world. The top one is using a computer as sort of an, as an open platform on which you can invent and create and collaborate. Now, I realize this slide violates all the laws of PowerPoint, but it really captures the essence of what I believe computers can mean in the learning process. It's from a computer scientist named Danny Hillis, and I'm just going to read the last two sentences. Hillis says, the amazing thing to me is not that a computer can hold the contents of all the books in the library, but that it can notice relationships between the concepts described in the books. Not that it can display a picture of a bird in flight or a galaxy spinning, but that it can imagine and predict the consequences of the physical laws that create these wonders. The computer is not just an advanced calculator or camera or paintbrush. It is a device that accelerates and extends our processes of thought. It is an imagination machine which starts with the ideas we put into it and takes them farther than we could ever take them on our own. Now, I think this is an intensely human view of computing. This isn't about turning children into machines. This is about using machines to augment human potential and to create opportunities that wouldn't have existed before. And the examples that I'm going to share with you are in that spirit. All of these examples share common principles. The respect for each individual learner. The need for authentic problems. Kids being engaged in work that matters. Having access to real tools and materials. You know, the internet access at this institution isn't a real tool. It's, it's a toy. It's a cardboard cutout of the internet. It's, 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 a, a, it doesn't even, it's not even a facsimile of what children use outside of the institution. And as a result, you create a greater gap between teacher and learner when you, when you use artificial tools and pretend that it reflects the world in which the kids live. We have expanded opportunities. We, that one of the principles is that learning is natural, that learning isn't something you need to be tricked or coerced or threatened into doing. It's something that you do all the time because it's part of being human and it's, and it's reward in and of itself. We have to believe that every child is capable, that there's a sense of urgency that drives our work. I know this might not be the case in Cutter. You may subtract a few years from what I'm about to say, but there have been microcomputers in schools for close to 30 years. Which means that if we're still trying to find a way to beg, bribe, cajole, trick, coerce, threaten teachers to use this stuff, we've got a problem because we've skipped more than a generation of children. In fact, there's a generation and a half of children who have been cheated of the learning experiences that they're entitled to. And the last big idea is related to that, that we should be using the technology and everything we do in a classroom should be committed to expanding social justice and democracy. So the first example comes from Neil Gershenfeld. Neil Gershenfeld is a professor at the MIT Media Lab. He runs something called the Center for Bits and Atoms. And he thinks and predicts, and there's a lot of evidence to suggest that he's right, the next major innovation, a revolution in technology, will be in personal fabrication. The idea being that instead of going to a shop and buying a watch, you know, now you can go online and you can order the watch and it arrives in the truck in a few days. Well, he suggests that in not, the not too distant future, you will actually find the watch you want online, modify it or design it yourself, and then have tools on your desktop that will allow you to make that watch. That we're returning to a culture of artisans and people who can create and solve their own problems. That instead of finding ways to teach Somali children how to use Excel, We'll teach them how to use technology to build the technology they need to solve their local immediate problems. And 
Gershenfeld teaches a class at MIT called How to Make Almost Anything. And in that class, he originally thought he would only get advanced engineering students in it. And he found that art majors and literature majors and people who wanted to learn to make things. You know, knitting is going through a resurgence in popularity. There's something innately human and beautiful about being engaged in creating something. And kids in his class have invented things like the clock radio that when you hit the snooze alarm, it runs away and hides. Um, that's a product now called Clocky. You can actually buy one. Or one of the students made a product called, made an invention called the Scream Bag. And it looks like, if you will, a knapsack or backpack that you wear on your front. And when you're sitting in an insufferable meeting or a talk like this, you can lean down into it and scream. And then when you walk outside to the car park, you can squeeze the bag and it will release your scream. And people laugh when they hear about it, and they think it's a ridiculous idea, and then they see it, and they want to know if they can buy one somewhere. So Gershenfeld suggests that we're only a couple of years, maybe a decade or two at most, from personal fabrication, and that we're currently at the sort of price point of when an institution like this originally got a computer. When an institution like this got a mini computer, it would cost about $20,000 to $100,000, and then the price has dropped dramatically, and the same will happen here. So the, the first little video clip I'm going to show you is Gershenfeld talking about this work with the TV actor Alan Alda from a television show in the United States. And then I'm going to show you some examples of what children do that's in this spirit. Creating and manipulating digital information, words and pictures. Pretty much the only actual thing I can make myself is the printed page. But what if this printer were instead a little factory capable not just of printing paper, but of manufacturing objects, being able to make things, you know, things like, well, bicycles, for instance. We're on the campus of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, outside the Media Lab, where much of the digital revolution was pioneered. And it's here that today, what Neil Gershenfeld believes will be the next revolution in personal empowerment is being explored. Was this, did you make this in the, in the lab? This is an all printed bicycle. Uh, this is uh, basically a complete bicycle made from two dimensional uh, polycarbonate cut on a water jet cutter. This machine, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, uses an incredibly powerful jet of water to cut through materials ranging from plastic to steel, fabricating in a few moments objects designed on a computer. It's just one of the machines available to students taking a course Gershenfeld teaches called How to Make Almost Anything. If I had one of these machines at home, you could email me this bike. My sister actually was emailed this bicycle in Sydney and she's riding one around. You're kidding. No, seriously. Isn't that incredible? So wait a minute. So that means that if I order a bike from a company someday, it won't come in a truck. It'll cut, all, everybody will have one of these machines, and a lot of what we order, lamps, furniture, bicycles, will get emailed to us. We'll have it a few seconds later. The only thing wrong in what you said is it's not when you order the bicycle, it's when you design the bicycle. <laughs> when you design the bicycle. <laughs> okay. Did, did you right. recognize what this is? This is actually a, a model of Matisse's Blue Nude number two. Um, you can see the, the leg here, the hind leg, uh, another leg here and the thigh, the arch of the back, uh, the head, and the hand holding the front wheel. In this How to Make Anything project, um, it's not just that students learn to make a bicycle, they learn to make their bicycle. Every bicycle is different, and part of expressing yourself in the bicycle you want is what this is all about. This is an exciting idea, because as we're talking, I just thought of two things I want to make. I, I remember one thing. I, I came up with an idea for something, and I wanted to make a model of it. And I went to the art store and bought cardboard. <laughs> And I got so, so bollocked up in trying to get the cardboard to stick together, I just threw the whole thing away. And it's a good idea, and I'd like to see it made. This sounds like I could so make what is it. it. It's so I'm going to stop that right there. But you know, this isn't something that's all that futuristic. You know, he, Saul Griffiths, who incidentally runs a wonderful website for kids called HowToons, H-O-W-T-O-O-N-S, which has sort of science fair projects for kids to be engaged in every day. Um, is, is 
you know, talks about how he actually sent the bicycle via email to someone on the other end of the world. And if you think of the implications of this as a teacher, um, we need a whole lot more art instruction in schools. We need kids doing hands-on science experiments, not just replicating ones that scientists did hundreds of years ago, but asking their own questions and solving their own problems as the norm rather than the exception to the norm. Kids need to be engaged in more field trips, etc. They need to be creating, and paradoxically, in far too many schools, that's the stuff that's being cut. So let's look at some, some other ways that, that this has ramifications for education. That's a photograph of me in the mid-1970s when I was about 12 years old. When I was 12 years old, I had the good fortune of being in Mr. Jones's class. Mr. Jones taught a seventh grade computer programming class. Once again, this was 1975 or 76 when I had Mr. Jones. The expectation was that in that nine week class, every kid would learn how to program a computer. Mr. Jones was a great teacher. He had to be, because first of all, we only had one terminal in the room connected to a mainframe system, and he had to find a way to keep us all engaged. And I suspect that he was so good because he was learning this stuff slightly ahead of us. You know, we talk about you know, kids knowing more than their teachers and the teachers having to catch up. And it was clear, clearly the case in some ways, even though the kids didn't know anything about computers at that point, that Mr. Jones had to have been learning this a little ahead of us and that we learned about learning because his enthusiasm and passion for what he was learning was infectious. And for the first time in my, my life, I felt intellectually powerful. Because I didn't know what was impossible, I thought everything was possible. That I was able to use the computer to make something that had never existed before. I could thrill and amaze my friends. I could teach them in clubs after school how they too could program computers. I could ride my bike to the next town and buy a copy of Creative Computing Magazine and type tens of thousands of lines of computer code into the computer and have them never work. But that was okay because then I would have to find my bug or I'd have to fix the program or I'd learn something along the way anyway that I could reintegrate into my own experience. And the habits of mind I developed in Mr. Jones's class served me every day of my life. Whether it's hacking my way through an airline voicemail system to get a human being on the phone or get my car out of a locked parking garage. The ability to look at a problem from different perspectives, to put myself in the beaker with the, with the molecules. Um, to view the world from lots of different perspectives really serves me well. And that guides all of my work with children, whether it's at the Cutter Academy or it's in Sydney or it's in the South Bronx, that we're, we're using the computers to make things that didn't exist before, to push our own intellectual boundaries. Now, a few years ago, Mr. Jones passed away after teaching for more than 30 years, and I got a phone call asking me if I wanted to take his job. And while I was honored to be asked, I didn't want to move across the country to teach the seventh grade computer class because I wondered, what the heck could you be teaching in that class today? We keep hearing kids are digital natives. They have handheld devices. They have computers in their shoes. They're the digerati, the clickerati, the end generation, the at generation, the now generation. We've probably heard six more of those terms at this conference. What could you possibly teach them in a seventh grade computing class? And remember, this wasn't gifted and talented or school to work or vocational education. This was in the rotation between making a tie rack for your dad and baking a souffle. Every kid was expected to learn a program in that nine weeks in seventh grade. And the result is that today, the curriculum in that classroom is keyboarding, which means kids are now being taught where the space bar and return key are, as if they are complete and utter incompetent morons. This is, by, by any measure, a diminution, a lowering of standards. We talk out of both sides of our mouths. We talk simultaneously about how so clever kids are, and then we deprive them of any rich experiences. It's as if Seymour Papert said, as a matter of policy, we have declared that children are to have no understanding of the technology that's so critical to their lives. You could read seven billion pages of BECTA or ISTE documents and not find the words computer science or programming once. As if being in control of the computer has no role in the social sciences, in the hard sciences, or in the arts. When we know that that's a lie. Everyone wants their kid to make Bill Gates money. We just don't put any systems in place where they can develop the skills that Bill Gates has. And in fact, I wasn't alone in having an experience like the one I enjoyed in Mr. Jones's class. That's a photo of the teletype that I learned how to program on. 
And if you zoom out, that's Bill Gates and Paul Allen, the founders of Microsoft, having almost exactly the same experience I had at almost exactly the same time, where they too attended a school that had some terminals connected to a mainframe system and some wise adults who said, here kids, see what you can figure out, lock up when you're done. And it served Mr. Gates pretty well, hasn't it? And yet, we're teaching kids where the return key is when they have a computer before they can speak. All of this is a way of saying that making things is better than being passive, but that making good things is even better. And it's important to remember that educational computing isn't about the hardware, it's about software. Because software determines what you can do, and what you can do determines what you have learned. So here's an example I showed yesterday. For those of you who've seen it before, I apologize. But this is an example of something built with programmable Lego and motors and sensors and a laptop where a five-year-old little girl decided she wanted to build a ballerina. And she wanted to bring that ballerina to life. It's a ballerina and it spins. And, and if you push this button, it goes that way. So do it. What do you think of it? Wonderful. She goes that way. Yeah. Sensational. Has anyone, have you seen any molders? And you've done this with your computer. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, you know, the teacher asks a question like, and you've done this with your computer, and the kid looks at her like she's out of her mind. You know, of course I did. This is what I do. I'm five. I can program robots. You know, at a time where the curriculum for five-year-olds is typically right and left. And she's not done it in some sort of futuristic context. She's, you know, she's done it in a completely five-year-old appropriate context where the dress is made out of a napkin and magic markers and the hair is pipe cleaners. And when she's moving her body around there, she's modeling what, what Jean Piaget called the syntonic body geometry. She's relating her own motion to the motion of the world, to the geometry of the world. You may have also noticed there was an 11-year-old classmate sitting there observing her work because I was teaching it in a multi-age environment. And when I talk about having multi-age classrooms, people always say, well, but, but, but aren't there like, different levels of kids? And uh, do you mean that like, the older kids teach the younger kids? I said, well, except in that example where the younger kid is teaching the older kid. You know, school is the only place where we group people by similar levels of incompetence. No one asked you your age before you walked into this room and made you sit with people the same age. Um, and again, if you want models of this in school, you could create them, but you could also look to things like orchestras, where kids have been working together collaboratively for ages. It's not that extraordinary. So here's another example. Instead of playing a video game, kids can design their own. So here's something created in Microworlds by a student I worked with, and it's called Sim Middle Ages. Some of you are familiar with SimCity and SimEarth and all those simulations. Well, here the idea was, could you build a simulation of life in the Middle Ages? So you had sliders for the number of plots of land, the number of laborers, et cetera. I can't remember all the variables. And then you randomly determined how much rainfall, plague, pestilence, taxation, you were responsible for, and then the simulation told you whether you lived or died in the Middle Ages. And if you died, you could go back and change a variable and maybe you would live. Now, I don't know what the algorithm is for surviving in the Middle Ages, because I suspect if there was such an algorithm, people would still be around. But the fact is, kids here are using mathematics in a really powerful way to simulate historical phenomena. That they're not just playing with a simulation, having something happen, and, and trying to guess at the causality, because they're in control of the entire system here. Here's another example. That's a wonderful piece of software called the Geometer Sketchpad. And if all of your high school students were using it, it would be a dramatic improvement. It's a way of playing with, with, with um, Euclidean geometry, Cartesian coordinate geometry on the computer. And yet, being a kid who didn't do so well in high school math, if I pull perpendicular bisector off a menu, something happens on the screen. I may or may not understand what happened. However, again, using microworlds, students can do things like this and build their own. So here's a list of some of the terms it knows. And if, as a teacher, I provide a couple starting points as a scaffold, like how to drop a point on the screen and how to tell the distance between two points, from there, kids can build an entire geometry curriculum. 
And more importantly, they can build the, the tool for learning about geometry and for doing geometry. So that if you can drop, if you can find a distance between two points, it's not hard to drop a midpoint. If you can drop a midpoint, you can find out about area and altitude, et cetera. And as you add a tool and add functionality to your environment, you're able then to learn more geometry. And if you find that it doesn't behave in a way that you like, you can add the tools or modify them to support your own style and, and your own needs. This is dramatically different from the way that computers are typically used to program children. Here's an example of, let me stop, go back and get the sound up, sorry about that. The, the next example is a machine created by a 13 year old who had, was incarcerated at the time. I spent three years creating an alternative, multi-age, high-tech, constructionist learning environment for teenagers who were in prison in, a, in the state of Maine in the United States. And we had an environment where not only did every kid have a computer, and we had a lot of rich constructive materials for them to work with, but the governor of the state and the secretary of education freed us of all curriculum and assessment requirements because they were smart enough to understand that if you wanted a different outcome with children who had been perennial school failures, you couldn't just do the same thing louder. And as a result, kids worked on extraordinary projects and learned a great deal, because we took the kids from where they were and moved them forward. If you want quantitative data, if you're interested in results, I'll give you the following piece of data. In three years, we didn't have a single child who had to leave our classroom for discipline reasons. Can you say that in your school? And I'm not talking about the best kids in the society. I'm talking about the worst kids in the society. We created an environment where they had meaning and respect and wanted to be there and wanted to continue to learn and grow. So this machine was created by a 13-year-old. All right, what my machine is supposed to do is record the temperature overnight. The gearbox makes it so it pulls, pulls the paper out very slowly. And then this motor uh, moves the pencil so it writes back and forth on the paper depending on the variable of the temperature sensor. So you get the idea, there's a temperature probe and the machine is geared down heavily so that the roll matting machine tape can last several days and it can graph fluctuations in temperature. So now he's putting it in a cup of snow. And there's a misconception in his thinking that's about now, to emerge. I put it in the cup of snow to make the temperature sensor drop and now I'm putting it and my sweatshirt to make it so it gets warmer. Okay, so what's the misconception? He's confusing heat and insulation. Now you would never identify that with a paper and pencil yeah. exam. Yeah. And the problem with paper and pencil exams the reason are, isn't that they're designed to inform practice because they rarely do. The, the, the problem with pencil paper exams is that they're, they're, they're created to rank and soar and punish children. And the, the, the evidence of that is one kid holding a camera, even a cell phone, and another kid talking about their work, and a teacher watching it creates a teachable moment where a teacher can help the kid overcome a misconception, as opposed to them just sort of passing along or waiting until the test score comes back if, in fact, any other correction is made. Chances are we've moved on to another topic by then. So, now, we don't have to just be building things out of, with computers. Um, my colleague John Stetson in the prison had a kid come up to him at one point and say, hey, do you know how to make guitars? I'd like to make a guitar. And John said no, but he then went and found himself a luthier who he apprenticed with. Now, I want teachers like that because if you wanted kids to be a good carpenter, you would have them apprentice with people who were good carpenters. If you want kids to be good learners, it should follow that you want kids to be with people who are learners themselves. And a teacher, you, if you remember back to the greatest teachers you had, the teachers who were most memorable, they were always passionate about something. It might have been deep sea Yugoslavian folk dancing. It may have had nothing whatsoever to do with the curriculum. But their, their ability to learn, their passion for learning, their quest for knowledge was, was something you wanted to emulate. And it was something that rubbed off and you learned from. So John decided to learn how to make guitars and then had to think about how to teach kids to build guitars. And these kids who we were told over and over again had impulse control problems could spend five or six hundred hours building a guitar. And then once you've built the guitar, just like if you've built the temperature plotting machine, then you can conduct other experiments. If you've built a guitar, what do you want to learn how to do? You want to learn how to play it. Then you want to learn how to read music. Then you want to play with others. 
So let's change gears slightly and talk about another powerful idea that doesn't get enough attention, I don't think, in discussions of school reform. There's a small municipality in Italy called Reggio Emilia, and after World War II, they decided they wanted to rebuild their community by heavily investing in the education of very small children. And henceforth has become something known as the Reggio Emilia approach, which shares some principles with Montessori, but I think is more child-centered and, uh, and more democratic. First thing you need to understand about Reggio Emilia is it's not a system. You can't buy it somewhere and just put it into a school. It's, it's an approach that's built on what they call the defense and promotion of the rights and potential of children. Now, that's a really big set of objectives for what education should be about. Um, they use authentic de and deliberate materials and tools. What do I mean by that? I mean a few things, like if you walk into a Reggio Emilia classroom of three-year-olds, it's not uncommon to see kids smashing piles with a sledgehammer or sawing wood or using a box cutter to cut cardboard. The sorts of things that we don't let high school students in the United States do. And the notion here is that if you want to do real work, you should re use real tools. If you're in a supportive culture where you're taught how to use the tools appropriately and where you have mutual respect, no one puts a nail through their foot. The kids use the tools appropriately and safely. They wear safety goggles, etc. If you serve kids lunch on paper plates every day, they never learn how to handle glass and china and silverware or the decorum associated with having a meal. So they, they use real materials. When, they, when I talk about deliberate materials, they might leave rocks in the classroom or rain gutters on the playground because kids will start to experiment with those materials in predictable ways that create teachable moments. Um, they use authentic problems that are rooted in what kids want to know. One of my favorites was a teacher asked a sort of traditional question, what did you do this weekend? And one little kid raised their hand and said, we went to the carnival. And the teacher said, how was it? And the kid said, crowded. And it, so the teacher said, what's a crowd? So the kids had to define, and they talked about it, and they discussed, and they argued and debated. And they said, a lot of people. And she said, how many? And they said, 90. She says, can you make a crowd? And the kids went running off, and some kids drew crowds, and some kids made them out of clay. And a group of kids who decided to make a crowd out of clay quickly realized that making 90 people was hard and invented the, the um, assembly line, where they sort of divvied up the work. Um, one group of kids drew a picture of a crowd, and, and another kid looked at the picture and said, hey, some of those people don't have faces. And the kid who drew it said, not everyone faces the same way in a crowd. That's the back of their head. So, so the problems are appropriate for the age level and for the context, but they're authentic and they're rooted in the experience of the kid. They talk about appointments, not schedules. If you need more time to learn something, that's fine, except at a certain point, lunch is ready. It would be rude not to be there. But they're not driven by a schedule or a calendar. They're big on the role of documentation. Now, you might just simplify this and dismiss it as portfolio assessment or e-portfolios or keeping track of kids' work. But, a por but documentation is a lot more complex than that in a Reggio classroom. Documentation is a visual representation of what a child is doing. It's a drawing or a digital photo that's put on the wall for others to see. Now, why is it displayed like that? Well, it's public relations. The parents get to see what the kids are doing and they can talk to them about it. It's a way of teachers seeing what a kid is thinking and working on so that the teachers can meet regularly in dialogue about what does that kid know, what do they need to know next, what sorts of materials or activities could we create that would help the kid have deeper understanding. But the best thing of all is it makes private thinking public. It allows other kids inside the heads of each other. So if a kid is having a problem, a classmate might have a solution. But also, a class might, might be inspired by what another child has done and integrate that knowledge into their work. There are two privileged teachers, adults in a Reggio school. One is the atelierista, who is the studio art teacher. It's the person who prepares the art materials and teaches the kids how to use them so that they can express themselves. Because if they're pre-literate, that's the best way of expressing themselves. And then there's the pedagogista, and I'd like to see this person in all schools. The pedagogista is the learning theorist, the person who helps the teacher see inside the head of the child and helps teachers talk about next steps and reflective practice. Loris Malaguzzi, who was the father of the Reggio Emilia approach, talked about the classroom um, 
being a thousand laboratories that supported the hundred languages of children, the multiple ways in which they could re represent their knowledge. And art is one of those principal ways of representing that knowledge. So let's look at, there's a little video clip here that I'm running without sound. That's really important. You know, we talk about problem solving or project-based learning in schools, and often the problem is either trivial or way too complex for the kids to engage in. I go to countless conferences where the stage is set up like this behind me, and a group of the best advanced placement students or IB students in the school are on the stage, and they're asked by the moderator, how would you inv invent schooling or reinvent schooling for the future? And the answers are almost always the same. I want to come in later, go home earlier, have less homework and a better salad bar. And then if you ask a group of teachers how they would improve school, you get oddly the same answers. You know, they want to come in later, have, go home earlier, have less homework and have a better salad bar. And that's because the problem is inappropriate. It's not a problem that a 15-year-old can answer. They don't know anything about education reform. Running, so they know about their experience, and the problems need to be geared to that. So the video that you've been seeing comes from the approach that the Reggio Emilia educators take, which is not to say to a three-year-old, how would you make the world a better place, but rather say to a group of three-year-olds, hey, can you build a park for the birds who come to visit? And as a result, the kids can draw and design and plan and measure and test and refine and engineer and paint and decorate this thing that works, that has fountains and stuff for the birds to play on and captures the light and makes shadows and is a source of pride and beauty that by extension makes the world a better place. Now, lest you think that I'm only talking about preschoolers, I'm not. This is an approach that we could all be learning from. And I recommend, there was a book on the last side called The Hundred Languages of Children, which is sort of the best overview of the Reggio approach. But you would, have to be, you would have to be a complete Neanderthal not to be able to generalize some of those principles to whatever grade level or age of students that you're teaching. The idea that we start from the interests of the child and their capabilities and we build upon them to allow them to, to learn and do and express their knowledge in ways that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So here's a technological example that I'm going to share with you. Um, some of you are familiar with at Christmas time in the United States and in England and countries such as that, often you make gingerbread houses, which where you take biscuits and you glue them together with some sort of icing and you decorate them with candy and lollies and, uh, and, it's, and cookies. And as a result, you create this sort of beautiful thing that you, you eat after the holidays. And we wanted to do that with the kids inside the prison just to give them a nice treat. And my colleague, Dr. Pappert, said, surely there's a way to get a computer in there. And to this day, I don't know if he was joking or not, but we took him, at his, took him up on his challenge, and this is the result. Now think about your computer lab and policies when you look at kids using computers and icing together. So, where's the brick? No. Well, see, it worked. All right. The lights flash, the tree inside here, the tree inside here, spins around, and it plays jingle bells. Actually, I bet I can get it going the So in that case, the Christmas tree is a Hershey kiss, there's lights. <laughs> The kids had a program of music to play, which they had to convert musical notes to, to frequencies. Okay, Mike. My house is wrong. And some kids had burglar alarms, others had outdoor lighting, some had doorbells, some had beds that when the alarm rang, it sort of tossed you out of bed. And this is just sort of a playful, whimsical way of exploring computer science and robotics and engineering using you know, a tradition that everyone understood. And this is something you would typically do with five-year-olds in school. Uh, these were 15 to 21-year-olds also doing it because it was whimsical and playful and, um, and in, this, you know, in, in, a, in a spirit that was attractive to all learners. So here's another example that comes from my summer institute that I ran. Last year, we had a pre-conference event where I took folks 
to the MIT Museum in Boston, or in Cambridge to be precise. And at the MIT Museum, there's this wonderful collection of kinetic sculptures created by the artist Arthur Ganson. Kinetic sculpture is a sculpture that moves. Sometimes you see them in airports with you know, billiard balls that roll and things that spin. And that light is reflected off mirrored pieces, et cetera. Maybe there's some water involved. And there was this little box that looked sort of like a Japanese bento box. And there was a crank on the outside of it. And it was rice inside. And when you turned the crank slowly, the rice undulated. It sort of danced in front of you. And it was this human-powered kinetic sculpture that was mesmerizing. You would just watch the rice dance. And I suggested to these very macho men from Texas that when they came back to the Institute the next day, this might be something they could build. But who wants to turn a crank when you could connect a motor to the thing and just watch it? And, and I did something that I'm not sure you're supposed to do in a museum, which was I reached into the rice to figure out how the machine worked. And, and they, they built the following. So this is the original machine. God, I hope. The video stopped. Let's try this again. That's weird. Multimedia is the Latin for doesn't work in front of an audience. Let's see if we can make this work. My proper computer has, has, is in the hospital, so I'm on a borrowed machine. So. Oh, is that it? No? Oh, don't crash. Please don't crash. Please don't crash. There we go. So there's the crank. And there's what they built. All right, we have our five axles, and then we geared it down 50 to 1 ratio because... They so they geared it down 50 to 1, and they put a little Lego person in it to look like they were drowning in the rice. And I will... I'll tell you the end of the story, which was... Poor guy's drowning in there. You can see the rice is dancing a little bit, like I had said. What's what's that? Okay, so let me play this instead. The so once they got the machine to behave like the one they had seen in the museum, they felt pleased with that. And like in any good project, if you're successful, you're inspired to try something more complex or test a larger theory. If you're unsuccessful, you have to engage in some sort of debugging strategy to find an alternative way of solving the problem. But in this case, they were successful. And, this, and observed that the rice sort of behaved like water and wondered if you built the machine on an incline, would it behave like water sort of washing ashore and creating erosion? And so they, they tilted their machine. They made some quick modifications to it. And in fact, it behaved in the predictable fashion that they had imagined. And once observing that, they realized that even though they satisfied their hypothesis and confirmed it, it wasn't as beautiful as the original, and they went back to the original, and they, let, and they left that going for a few days. Now, that's completely in the spirit of what the Reggio educators do with two- and three-year-olds, but it was done by adults in the context of learning about using technology for learning. Now, so here's some, some photos from the environment that I worked in in the prison where my colleague John Stetson is working with a child to solve a problem that neither of them have an answer for. The teacher's not pretending to, to have the answer until the bell rings and then springs it on the kid. There's opportunities all around us, especially in the increasingly complex world, for us to learn together. The top right-hand corner, you see digital photos of a kid's gear ratio and, and annotations on it that went on the wall so other people could learn from it. We need to be putting more stuff on the walls. We need to be putting more stuff on the wiki. But if you don't have a wiki, use the walls. And, and I've got a video, which I'm not going to show you for, for time's sake, but there's a kid laying in a beanbag chair, and he's reading a book of, of speeches by Martin Luther King. And to his right are some balls of clay, and to his left is a robot. And in this 30-second video I have, this kid sort of spontaneously goes from reading this book to playing with, to making something with the clay, to reading the book, to fixing a robot, all at the same time. We talk about kids multitasking. It doesn't have to just happen digitally. There's all sorts of activities they can be engaging in. I was once having a conversation with a colleague, and I wish I could cite the study, but it turns out there's actually some research where five-year-olds or seven-year-olds had clay put on their classroom desks while they were doing other activities, like the teachers talking at them. And they actually found that comprehension increased 
while the kids had, played, had clay to play with. Um, it's a way of sort of settling down and focusing. So in order for us to be creating computer projects that are meaningful and efficacious in classrooms, we need to really think about what is it that makes a good project? What are the elements that of a good project? And I, I want to share some of these with you. One is that it has purpose. There's a reason for doing it. That we have sufficient time. That it's personally meaningful. That, that the project is complex. It's not simple. It involves serendipity. We can make connections to other things. We can make discoveries that lead us in directions we may not have anticipated. Or if we run into a roadblock, we find out a different way of, of proceeding. The projects are connected. They're, they connect people. They connect ideas. They connect disciplines. And they may be connected via the World Wide Web as well. They're shareable. This is critical. Why am I making this? Does it have an audience? Is someone else going to be interested in it? Does it have any value? And if it's shareable, that means that I can talk about it with someone else. You know, if you just had people come into your classroom, they could be colleagues, they could be parents, who said to children, hey, that's cool, how did you do it? You would find that achievement would rise that having a, a reason and a vehicle for articulating your practice is critical for kids as well as teachers. And they have access to constructive materials. And we need to be able to ask questions in the spirit of Reggio, like, is this problem solvable? Can we get our heads around it at least? Maybe if it's not completely solvable, we may learn that this problem is really hard and bigger than me, and I need to take another class, or I need to study harder, or I need to practice more. Is it monumental or substantial? Schools love monumental projects. By that I mean the 300 identical arithmetic problems on the worksheet. If we make it 500, it's an even better project. Um, or we tell kids that they have three months to work on a five paragraph essay. That's not a real substantial project. That's, that's just a make work. A, a real substantial project is a kind of project that burns inside of you, that you can't sleep at night because you want to solve it. It breaks my heart when I visit schools that have lots of computers, even one-to-one -one schools where every kid has a laptop, and they're surfing the web or they're playing flash games. That means they haven't been inspired to do something more constructive. When I was in high school, I would have problems in, you know, in programs that I was creating that would bother me to the point where I would put my hand up in biology class to take the hall pass, pretending I was going to go to the restroom, run to the other end of the school, fire up the mainframe, which caused the building to shake, and debug my program, which I got caught doing once, actually, which is hugely humiliating when you're 15. But I want kids to be able to have that sort of sense of, of ownership of a problem, that it really matters to them. And we need to be able to answer the question of who the project satisfies and what, the, what can they do with that. You know, is a kid just being taught something because it's in a list of stuff we're supposed to teach them with the faint promise that someday they might use it, or can it be used today to, to learn something else that's important to them? And it's one of the great principles of modern teaching is that less is more, that if we make connections between subject areas, if we have rich projects, it connects lots of things, and we don't have to teach 1,500 discrete skills, we could, we could focus on five or six things that kids really need to know, and they'll learn everything else along the way. Now, I often find that you know, the kid who built that dancing ballerina or some of the other ro robotics projects or other computing projects that kids are involved in, the first time they use the materials, they're able to do extraordinary work. In the case of robotics, they're often able to, to build something that kids much older than them or even college-age engineering students might not be able to accomplish. Certainly more complex and sophisticated than you would get to be able to do if you followed a scope and sequence two-year curriculum in robotics in school. And, and you have to ask yourself then, how is that possible? How is it possible that in a four or six hour workshop with teachers or kids, I can have people create incredibly complex projects all by themselves in their community of practice and, with, and have the pride and sense of satisfaction associated with that when if I taught them robotics, they wouldn't be able to achieve that result. And that's led me to a theory that I call the good prompt is worth a thousand words, which says that with a good prompt, challenge, problem, or motivation, appropriate materials, sufficient time, and a supportive culture, you're able to solve problems and achieve things that are much bigger than you thought you were capable of. So again, with a good prompt, challenge, motivating question, problem that matters to you, 
appropriate materials, sufficient time, supportive culture, you're able to do things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And this is the truth, I think, for, for any kind of teaching. And, and, it, and it's clearly brought to, to light when you see kids doing extraordinary things with computers. One of the reasons why kids are better at this than adults is why? They do it. And knowledge is a consequence of experience. It's amazing to me that educators find this to be mysterious, that kids are better at using computers than they are. Because they sit around at conferences and complain about the fact that kids are better at using computers than they are while the kids are using computers. It's a really simple equation. And instead of talking about digital natives or digital immigrants, how about we talk about tech insurgents? Because if we're waiting 30 years to use a computer, there's something wrong with that adult. Every other aspect of society, every other professional is using a computer. It's just, not, just teachers that aren't. They're somehow allergic to electricity or something. Um, and if you're not talking to the teacher next to you, if you're not collaborating, if you're not learning and sharing from, from your colleagues in your own school building, if you're not working with kids in your classroom, good luck with your online project with you know, the classroom in Belarus. Why are we looking for you know, online projects when we don't collaborate in our own community, when we don't learn from the people next to us? Why are teachers talking about Web 2.0 breaking down isolation? Where is this isolation coming from? Why are they isolated? If we don't solve that problem, the technology is not going to address it. Now, we should look at projects through a better lens than we've typically been using, a rubric, if you will. Instead of ticking off boxes for curricular objectives, we ought to be thinking about the sort of dichotomy that Seymour Papert often wrote about, of walking past an art classroom where children are carving sculptures out of soap, and they're making these things that they're proud of, that they actually brought home, that their parents liked, not just because the kids cre created it, but because it was actually beautiful, and they kept it for years, or the painting the kid made where the parents framed it, or put the story in a scrapbook, Compare that to an Algebra 2 class. Now, how many kids get to school early to hang out with their algebra teacher, and how many parents frame their worksheet and, or put it up on a refrigerator? We ought to be raising our standard for, for what we expect from student work. And some of the ways that I think we ought, to, we ought to evaluate it would be the ways that an artist or an art critic would. Is it beautiful? Is it thoughtful? Is it meaningful? Is it sophisticated? Does it respect the audience or does it waste their time? You know, everyone's excited about kids making digital movies or podcasts. But I find in my experience of going to schools all over the world, there ought to be a sign in every classroom where kids are making media. And a sign should have two rules on it. The first rule should be your movie should be shorter, and the second is it should be edited at least one more time. Or as we would say in northern New Jersey where I grew up, why should anyone have to sit through that crap? We're so enamored by kids using computers that, you know, having them fart or burp at the voice thread, you know, gets them a gold star and their teacher gets to speak at national conferences. We suffer from something Papert called verbal inflation, where we're terribly excited about so very little. That doesn't mean that kids can't do extraordinary stuff. I expect them to do extraordinary stuff. But when they sort of pop off about some topic for 30 seconds that they've never thought about, done no research for, into the computer and we're so, somehow impressed because they've done this, I'm unimpressed. I expect that kids can do that. They ought to be able to create stuff that's beautiful, enduring, and sophisticated. So, you know, there are lots of ways we can use materials. So if you're thinking about robotics, for example, you can use the materials to teach a specific concept like gears, friction, multiplication of fractions, work, force, torque. You can have a thematic project like we're going to build a theme park or, an amuse or a factory or an airport and study the systems involved in, the, in those themes. We have a curricular theme like identify a problem in, in sub-Saharan Africa and build a machine for solving that problem. Or we can just use the stuff as part of our bag of tricks that allows us to be more expressive and to learn things so that we can use it like we would use pencil or paper. Papert talked forever about, you know, we don't have a pencils in, cur in the curriculum conference. Um, we don't buy one pencil for a school and then have kids sign up to use it every two weeks, like we do in way too many classrooms. We ought to be able to use this stuff in a transparent fashion. Okay, another great educational idea. Sylvia Martinez, president of Generation Yes, is at this conference. Generation Yes starts with the assumption that the only renewable resource in school is children, 
that by them contributing to the, to the operation of the school, the school benefits, and so do the children as well, not just in a service learning context, but also in learning how to communicate what they know with others. So they use different models and have curricula to support teach students who learn to use technology, and then for their culminating activity, they partner with a teacher in that school and teach the teacher how to use the computer to, solve, to teach the other kids or to solve their own problems. And as a result, you have this renewable professional development resource because there's always new kids, and, it's a, and the numbers work in your advantage. If a teacher needs help every year, those kids know who that teacher is, and it, the kids volunteer to help that teacher. And as a result, what's the teacher going to do? Say, no, I don't want help. I'm going to, you know, some kids not going to be able to do their work because I'm going to be stubborn. No, the teacher gets helped. And as the teacher gets helped, the teacher becomes more proficient. Or the students provide tech support or peer mentoring for others. That you build this community of practice that includes not just your colleagues, but treats children like colleagues as well and gives them a say in the operation of the school and allows them to produce and contribute in ways that are valuable. Gives them a sense of, of accomplishment and also helps them develop their own sort of ability to teach and share and communicate their knowledge with others. Now, this is Negro, Nicholas Negroponte, who created the one, the one laptop per child computer, what's also known as the $100 laptop. And he's been working in, in the area of, of technology for, for solving all sorts of the world's problems for years. Over the last five years or so, he's been committed to this notion of every child in the world having a personal computer because it's a way of connecting them to the world. And it's, more importantly, a way for them to construct knowledge in a meaningful, modern way. So I'm going to back this up for a second and let him speak for a moment about a vision that we share about using this computer. Not just to connect, not just to look things up. This picture was taken in 1982, just before the IBM PC was even announced. Seymour Papert and I were bringing computers to schools in developing nations at a time when it was way ahead of itself. But one thing we learned was is that these kids can absolutely jump into it just the same way as our kids do here. And when people tell me, you know, who's going to teach the teachers to teach the kids, I say to myself, what planet do you come from? Okay. It's not a person in this room, I don't care how techy you are, there's not a person in this room that doesn't give their laptop or cell phone to a kid to help them debug it. Okay, we all, all need help, uh, even those of us who are very seasoned. This, this picture is Seymour 25 years ago. Um, Seymour made a very simple observation in 1968 and then sort of basically presented in 1970, April 11th to be precise, called Teaching Children Thinking. What he observed was that kids who write computer programs understand things differently and when they debug the programs they come the closest to learning about learning. That was very important and in some sense we've lost that. Kids don't program enough and boy if there's anything I hope this brings back, it's programming to kids. It's really important. Using applications is okay, but programming is absolutely fundamental. So often when I talk about kids programming computers, someone in the audience will say, or at least they're thinking, well, is Gary really suggesting that every kid should learn to program? To which I like to reply, well, we decided that every kid should haiku. We've made all sorts of decisions about it. Who was at that meeting, by the way, where we decided that every kid needed to haiku? Um, show of hands. Right, no one was at that meeting. We've made thousands of decisions about what children should learn. Somehow, we've decided that in 12 years of schooling, they shouldn't even have the experience that I had in the mid-70s of having agency over the computer. And one of the things that's most exciting about the, the One Laptop Per Child project is, as Negroponte says in the video, it comes with actually three environments for programming. Um, so that kids can solve their own problems without having to be consumers. That if you're in Sudan, or you're, you're in Somalia, or Rwanda, or Nepal, where the average per pupil spending is $40 a year, um, you don't have to wait for some company to sell you software. You can build the thing you need. And that's in the tradition of the other stuff that I've been talking about today. You know, it's a durable, low-powered computer with a great display, with mesh networking, which means that every machine can share what they're working on with every other machine. Whether you have a network or internet access or not, if I'm working on a piece of writing, I can invite Rebecca to contribute to, to work on the same document at the same time. And one of the concepts that people don't understand about the One Laptop Per Child project is that it's not a school project. You can't talk about this without people whining about, but what about the teacher training? What about the curriculum? 
The question is, why shouldn't every child in the world have access to what my children have? That's what it's about. It's about children having the computers, and if the kids happen to bring those computers to school, maybe they'll help their teachers figure out what to do with them. And of course, they've seen all over the world this, this sense of urgency come to life where teachers realize that these kids are capable of such extraordinary things, and it's infectious, and the teachers want to support that. I was talking with some teachers from Colombia, the country of Colombia, and they were going to be buying hundreds or thousands of these computers for, for an area inside the tropical rainforest. And they had some real problems. They didn't have the same sort of problems we have here or in the United States, like the teachers don't want to do it. They had a problem that it's hard to have computers in a place with no electricity. So they were sort of brainstorming, what can we do about this? And they said, well, you could, you, we can't have a generator because you can't get fuel to the school because it's in the middle of the rainforest and there's no way to get petrol to the place. And then they thought about solar panels, and that might work, except they'd have to get the solar panels several hundred meters in the air above the rainforest canopy, and that would pose a serious engineering challenge. And then I kid you not, these two women looked at each other, shrugged, and said, we've got a river. And they ordered the computers. And I bet you within 12 months, they were getting power from the river. And a lot of people look at this and say, why would you be giving computers to places where they don't have clean water? Well, they don't have clean water for political reasons, not because of any sort of innate reason. And it's funny, a funny thing happens. When every kid has a computer, electricity tends to follow, and clean water tends to follow. That the adults in the community, the politicians, start doing the right thing and stepping up. They build the, computer, the network from the child up. I was talking with some educators in the United States who were getting these devices, and they were well-meaning people who really wanted to do the right thing by the kids in their community. And they said, well, will it run our filter and our firewall and, and our gradebook system and our Novell network and our proxy server? And I said, no. The answer is no. They're computers for the children, not for the system. And if you want to provide internet access for every kid in the community, you can ask all the business owners and people with routers in their homes to please take the passwords off of them, and then you have in instant ubiquitous access to the internet. And if you're thinking about and worrying about the future, you ought to be able to answer the following question. What will your school or university or other institution do when every kid has internet access on their person? For how many years after that point, which is in the very, very, very near future, will your school still be hiring people to protect the computers from their users? And as I said to ICT Qatar when I was here in November, it is perfectly reasonable to protect children. It is completely unreasonable to protect computers. They're just damn boxes. And the notion that the users are going to do terrible things, you know, if, if, if I could actually check my email while I was here, a person who's been using a computer for 33 years and has a PhD, if I could actually check my mail, then the evildoers would win. Who puts these policies in place? They're moronic. You can walk into an internet cafe anywhere in the world and every computer works. And you walk into a school and there's a high probability that they don't work at all. And they worked a lot better when they came out of the box than after the IT department got done fixing them. So the question is, are we buying computers that allow people to compute and think and collaborate and create, or are we buying sculpture? If we're buying sculpture, then we should keep these people in place who tell you what you may not do and treat teachers and children like imbeciles and felons. Or we should embrace the technology and the opportunities that exist already. One of the reasons why I tell schools that they should be thinking about one-to-one -one computing is because it provides a few years of training wheels for the adults in that building. Because it's never been a question of if every kid will have a computer, it's only been a question of when. And the adults need to sort of start embracing that idea so they see the wonderful possibilities and they can put policies and practices in place that will build upon the availability of this technology and the kids' usefulness of it. So, let's, let's sort of get to one last big idea and then I'll wrap up. Um, this may come as a surprise. I think one of the big ideas in the world is something called the Simon Bolivar Youth Orchestra that's in Venezuela, and you may have heard of it. It's referred to as El Sistema. It's a project that's been running for, since the 70s. Um, 
where hundreds of thousands of the poorest children of Venezuela are taught to play instruments and perform in local, regional, and national symphony orchestras. And it's committed to the notion of social cohesion, of having people work together in a democratic setting where the individual is featured, but the individual is contributing to the good of the whole. And computers can play a huge role in elevating the arts and arts education experiences for children. It is complete baloney that art and music programs were cut because we bought computers. Art and music programs were cut before we had computers. They continue to be cut, and, they, and they're cut because they interfere with our ability to drill useless facts into children. That, you know, the, president, the former president of the United States, Bill Clinton, was interviewed recently in the United States, and he said... If he hadn't been in the band, he could have never been president of the United States. And that, that's why he works so hard to benefit a charity called Save the Music, which tries to raise money and start school music programs. Well, you know, I just wanted to grab him and shake him through the television and say, it's your policies that killed the music. It's turning classrooms into, into Dickensian sweatshops where all you cared about was you know, regurgitating answers to questions nobody cared about and standardized tests and reading and writing and arithmetic that created this context in which children were deprived of these rich arts experiences. And if you want to think about the future, I suggest you think of it in the following fashion. If computers and interactive whiteboards and cell phones are technology, so too is the school. The school is this technology of 25 little desks, one big desk, in this concrete rectangle. And we ought to be thinking about in the future, what is it that's the affordance of school? What kind of benefit do we gain from being in that box with the 25 little desks, one big desk? Well, I think the answer to that question is that that's where you have the orchestras and the pottery kilns and the science labs and the field trips and the drama productions, the things that gain benefit from us being together. And we get away from walking into a classroom and the kids being told, turn to chapter 13 and read it. And it's no better to have a teacher say, open your browser and read this web page. That sort of stuff can be done outside of school. And the reason why people come together is to gain benefit from being together. So it's the stuff like orchestral programs, music, art, dance, drama, science, real experiences in the world that are collaborative, maybe even multi-age or intergenerational, that, that school should be about. And the looking stuff up, getting answers to questions, memorizing content, if you will, can be shifted to outside of school. Now let's look at what this means in a He's only been playing context. the trumpet for a year, but it's already had a profound effect. Hang on a second. So, you're going to hear in a moment a piece of music con composed by some students in the United States. I teach this online course called Learning and Technology, and I changed everything about it because I wanted to model online the sort of constructive, child-centered, Reggio Emilia-like environment that I would like to create for people in a face-to-face -face setting. And I figured, why not try to do this with graduate students? So I could talk about this methodology for an hour. I've written papers about it. It's on my website. But the idea was, instead of talking about assignments, I wanted to remove the coercion from the classroom, and I have learning adventures. And that's not just a change of terminology. I don't grade their product at all. I look at their participation. So every week, the students are confronted with a new learning adventure. It runs the gamut across a million disciplines. They change every year. Um, and I want the students to have the experience and reflect upon it. And the feedback for the product comes from each other. If there's 20 students commenting on each other's work, it doesn't matter what I think. Why does it matter what I think? I'm there to keep the conversation going, and particularly when I'm working with educators, to help them be reflective about what they learned and compare that to the observations of what their colleagues learned. So one of the learning adventures that I often start off with is download a piece of software called Finale Notepad, which is a free music composition package. It's not free anymore. It is almost free. We'll find an alternative. But anyway, the kids, the, the students, adults, mid-career professionals like ourselves would download the software, and I say, okay, you've got five days to compose a piece of music. And the great thing about teaching online is that I can't hear the screaming because inevitably there are people in the class who've never done anything with music. There are some people who have great experience who have taken piano lessons or cello lessons or th music theory classes in 
high school or college. But within a few days, everyone is able to compose a piece of music. And what they learned from that experience is that in a community of practice with distributed expertise, we can help one another. When I ask them to debrief the experience, some people will say, well, I looked things up online when I needed help, or I looked at the online help, or I asked my classmates for help, or I joined the community of Finale Notepad users, or I listened to my colleagues' music and that inspired me to try something, or one student said I just moved the balls and sticks around until I got something that sounded good. Another said I was interested in putting notes on the score at random, and I googled random music and found out about serial music, and I bought a CD by Schoenberg. So I made all sorts of connections I would have never imagined, but all the examples that the students gave me were informational. They used the computer to look something up to get an answer to a question, and they missed the forest for the trees. The powerful idea here, and in most of the examples I've shared with you, was not that they were getting answers to questions, but that they were composing music that they were composers. They were engaged in the exact same activity that great composers through time had been engaged in. So, I threw my, my students this September into this crazy learning adventure, and a young teacher in Colorado named Ann Smith said, walked into her 10th grade English class the next day and said, my nutty professor wants me to compose a piece of music, so guess what that means? That means you compose a piece of music. And the kids panicked in exactly the same way the teachers in my class do. And one of them said, but, 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 what is the music supposed to be about? And she said, how about Lady Macbeth? And you'll hear in a second the result. It's as good as anything John Williams ever composed. Um, and this, you know, all attempts at humor aside, in order to compose this piece of music, these kids had to share their own knowledge, because again, there were some kids who knew about music and others who didn't, but they had to actually explore what it meant to write a piece of music that brings Lady Macbeth to life. And they then blogged about the experience, and the level of insight on the part of these students was extraordinary. And I sort of, I was invited to join in the discussions, and I said to them, you know, what do you think about this crazy English teacher asking you to compose music in English class? And how could you have possibly composed music when she didn't teach you how to compose music? And it really was a rich discussion about learning and teaching as well. Now, all sorts of opportunities like this exist because of the technology. Oh, I want to, um, let me go back a slide. Where students, regardless of their talent, oh, that's bad. I've done something... My clicker has gone haywire. Let me, I'll wrap up in a second. Let me just, I want to share a couple quick examples with you. I apologize for that. So I was working in a school where every kid had a laptop. And this is a young lady who's an extraordinary pianist, composer, singer. And she goes into this room in a moment where she's using what, in the late 90s, cost $20,000. $25,000, this digital recording box that allowed her to be all the instruments and overdub her voice and drop instruments out and transpose and, and such. Now every kid has this in your laptop. She was in a school where every kid had a laptop beginning in about 1993 or 94. So there was a commitment to sort of student pluralism in learning and project-based learning and such. But, you know, even though she has extraordinary musical ability and talent, the technology allows her to go further than she could have on her own. And it's one of those happy stories where you, know, you lose track of a student over time and it turns out that her name is now Missy Higgins, she was Melissa at the time, 
If you go to MissyHiggins.com or her page on the iTunes Music Store, you can buy that song that she composed in year 11. She won the equivalent of five Australian Grammy Awards a couple of years ago. So her music has been on television shows. She's appeared on major shows in the United States. Well, this is her new CD. It came out today. It's called On a Clear now, Night. I, you can't, you can't connect the dots Missy between Higgins. her being in a school with laptops and her having a successful music career. But the point here is what Hilla said at the beginning, which was with the computer, it amplifies our human potential, allows us to go further than we could have gone on her own. Haters. Skip that quickly. And Alan Kay, the person responsible for inventing a personal computer, said that the computer is simply an instrument whose music is ideas. And when you think about music and art, the computer is an instrument that makes music and art accessible and possible for more children. I had the great luck of attending a high school where I had professional music teachers on the faculty, and I had four years of music theory class which very few kids ever in the history of the United States had four years of music theory. And yet, if I wrote something for cello or bassoon, I never got to hear my work perform. If I wrote something for the piano that was too complicated for the teacher to play, which is everything you write when you're 14, you never got to hear your work perform. Even when I went to university, I was in a jazz program. We wrote for strings. We were told that none of the string players would be allowed to perform our music. So now, with a $50 MIDI keyboard and with a laptop, we have the ability to be composers, to be performers. There are, there are countless examples of children writing musicals, performing them for the community, and designing sets and costumes. And in fact, you're not the designing set, you can pro project it, and the set can change. So that we have these opportunities to bring the performing arts to life in ways that were never imaginable. This is all a way of saying that we have this, this amazing construction material that allows us to not only invent, but to invent things that weren't be possible otherwise. And the barometer we should use, the metric for evaluating success of using computers in school should be, what do the kids do with them? Do they do things that dazzle and amaze us, truly, that, that live up to their potential, or merely deliver the curriculum? We need to you know, be able to move from routine activities to transformational activities, to teacher-centered, to learner-centered, and come up with activities for using a computer in which the computer is not only integral, but pro pro plays a critical role that wouldn't be possible otherwise. Well, in the most cases, we're sort of centered somewhere in the middle there. This is a whole way of saying, in conclusion, that the technology matters. I go to a lot of conferences like this, probably 30 a year, all over the world, where some blowhard like myself gets up on stage and says, it's not about the technology. And it's at that point I look at my watch and think to myself, then how come I'm not at the Montessori conference? It has to be about the technology. Maybe we're just not very good at articulating why it is that technology matters. And I think the technology matters, as I've been saying over and over again, because it allows kids to have a quality of experience to solve problems that they wouldn't have otherwise. It allows them to be mathematicians and filmmakers and, and composers and photographers and chemists and ge geneticists and video game designers and on and on. You want to think about the role of teachers in the 21st century? I'll end with this example. You know, it's a Saturday morning and you've taught all week and you're exhausted and you go to, to, to make a cup of coffee and you reach for the milk and you're out of milk and you think, oh, and you have to run out to the shop and you throw on a hat and maybe an overcoat and you run out to the shop and you're congratulating yourself as you're leaving with your quart of milk or a liter of milk, you're congratulating yourself for for having gone unnoticed, at which point a former student sees you from the corner of the parking lot. And they come running towards you with their arms open wide. And they want to give you a big hug, which you want to avoid because you haven't brushed your teeth and you're having a bad hair day. But they give you a big hug and they want to reminisce. And they always say, you remember that time, we? And the rest of the sentence is never, I assure you, crammed for the graduation exam or used all of our vocabulary words in a sentence. The, the thing they want to reminisce about is some project that you did with them when they were young. And that's what creates memories. And if you want to think about being a great 21st century educator, I think your primary responsibility is to make memories. I think about, like... Now, let me just go back to this slide in one second. I'll end with this example and finish up. So I'm working in this prison. A kid comes to us named Tony. He's 17 years old. He's about six feet tall. He's wearing an orange jumpsuit, which many had tried to escape. He, and he fell in love with building cameras. And he could talk about f-stops and apertures. He built pinhole cameras and developed film and turned negatives into positives and then turned them into digital images. And he had plans in his notebook for building a hot air balloon that would take an aerial photo when an ice cube melted and released the shutter. And when I asked him if he thought that would work, he was furious with me to question it. He said he had tested all the pieces. He just hadn't had time to make it fly. And we thought he was leaving the next day. 
but he ended up staying a few extra weeks. And it was fortuitous for the purposes of my research because he said that since he had been in this environment where every kid had a computer, where we were built upon the, the sort of progressive educational traditions of Dewey and Papert and John Holt and Deborah Meyer and Dennis Litke and Herbert Cole and put the kids' needs and passions and experience and expertise ahead of some arbitrary list of stuff from some Bureau of Studies, he thought about the world in a different way. And he built a vehicle that became known as Gopher Cam to investigate what was down the groundhog holes that were all over the campus. And I'll let him speak for himself. I think about like doing something totally different now. Like when I looked at the groundhog hole, I wanted to go down it. <laughs> and before I just look at it as a hole and stick a stick down it. <laughs> well, what makes you want to go down it? Because I can. Because you can. Yeah. Oh, I want to. Yeah, why do you think you want to? I don't know, just see what's down there. Mm -hmm. So you think you're a little more curious? Yeah. Tony was 17. Tony hadn't shown up at school until he, since he was 12. And he said that neither had anyone he could think of in his peer group. And yet he was able to excite the imaginations of everyone in his facility where he was able to engineer this machine that he could send down a gopher hole and, and find out what was down there. And he didn't learn a lot about the gopher hole, but he learned the sorts of lessons that NASA scientists learn when they don't convert Fahrenheit to Celsius and their probe bursts into flames. So if he worked for three days on something and, and a twig busted his machine apart, he learned a lot about engineering challenges. But imagine if our goal for children graduating from our schools was that if they saw a hole in the ground or the seas ahead or the heavens above and they had a question about those natural or man-made wonders in the world around them, that they possessed the confidence at least to begin to answer that question for themselves. Maybe just to learn that that's a really complicated question and I need to learn some more stuff, or maybe to solve it completely. But imagine if that was our goal. And I end with a quote that reinforces this idea. This comes from the great American broadcaster Edward R. Murrow, who, who gained notoriety and fame covering World War II um, for radio in the United States. And in 1958, he told the National Association of Broadcasters the following. He said, this instrument can teach, it can illuminate, yes, it can even inspire, but it can do so only to the extent that humans are determined to use it to those ends. Otherwise, it is merely wires and lights in a box. It's up to each and every one of us to raise our game, to think about computers in more co child-centered, creative, socially collaborative ways, and then all of the problems that, that, we, that we think we're dealing with sort of just fade by the, the roadside. And with that, I thank you for your time and patience and good humor. And it's been an honor to be with you once again. Thanks, folks.